To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his body atonement for sin. Father, uh, we come to express the, the thanks for the things that we didn't say or that we didn't verbalize here, but yet we feel in a very grateful protection, provision, wisdom for decisions. Just laying your hand over our life in the midst of a very chaotic world, we thank you today for preserving our life and for giving us these friends and these uh, companions that we just, some of us just spoke about that are uh, able to bless us and encourage us and actually help to lead us and guide us along and show us a better way. I think of a, a letter that I just got recently from a guy who's in prison and, and how he said that it was there in prison in a, in a church service that he went to that was the first time that he ever heard and fully realized that Jesus died on the cross for him and that he had to respond to that in some way. And so all, all the wacky situations that come along can all be brought to, good, to a good end and for a good purpose. All things work together for good to those who believe and those who love and those who are called. And we want to be part of that group and we want to respond unto you and to then look back and say thank you for all of these difficult circumstances, yet they made my, they drew my life closer to you. We think of not only the Florence family, but many others who have lost loved ones or those who are 
dealing with sickness or who are, who are maybe right now in the struggle with chemotherapy or with uh, some form of ongoing uh, battle with an illness. Sustain them and help them and heal them, we do ask and pray. We thank you for <clears throat> your word, the scriptures that we can come to for guidance, that we can come to for perspective. If all we do is look around at observe light and form our own opinion, we can, we can be way far off from the real, actual truth. And yet, you've told us that your word is truth, and you've made it available to us. And so we come here today to actually ponder it and seek to apply it to our life, and we pray that your spirit will guide us in that process. We, uh, we thank you for making possible everything that we do and that we have and that we can accomplish. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. The, the pastor says stand, so... the verse. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Here we go. Praise the King. Praise the King. Praise Father for your love and for your mercy, for your justice. You are a good king. 
and we give you our praise. And we need to, in our hearts and in our minds, acknowledge our position to your goodness and to your wisdom and to your knowledge. And we need to learn to submit our will to yours. So, Father, as we continue in worship, we sing this next song in submission to you, to your will, and not our own. Thank you in Jesus' name. As we go forth, our God and Father, let us daily in the fight that all the world might see your glory and your name be lifted high. And in this name we overcome, for you shall see us safely home. Your church, we lift our voice and pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And in this name, we overcome, for you shall see us safely home. Now, as your church, we lift our voice and pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for leading us in that music. We're in Proverbs chapter 30. For the past couple of weeks, we've looked at some of the sayings there of this guy whose name was Agur. 
He told us that there are mysteries in life, things like the way the eagle can fly and the way two people can fall in love. And he said, it's too amazing for me. I don't understand it. And these mysteries, we've described them as, can lead to faith. And we looked last week at some of the tragedies that he talked about. Things he said the earth can't stand, life can't put up with but so long, and then there's an explosion. And these can lead us to wisdom because we're going to go through them. We're going to experience tragedies. Today, through the example of some little tiny animals or creatures, um, he talks about disabilities. And the point I want us to think about is that we may be disabled or handicapped in some form or fashion. Everybody probably has something that is set against them from the start. But these handicaps can at the same time lead us to trust. These disabilities can cause us to trust in something else. He uh, mentions in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 24, he mentions several creatures that are small, and yet, and this is his description of them, they are small, so that's their disability, comparatively speaking, and yet they're able to thrive, and I take it that he emphasizes the fact that they are small to make the point that they don't have all the advantages. In fact, they are disadvantaged from the start, because when you're small, uh, you're handicapped or you're somehow more vulnerable then you're just naturally at risk or danger. Uh, if you're a mouse or you're an elephant, uh, if the chances are the mouse is going to be more in danger. It's just the normal state of affairs that if you're a tiny creature, you're likely to be stomped on or eaten or uh, something. In, and um, so he mentions these. I'm going to read verse 24 of Proverbs 20, uh, 30. Four things, he says, on earth are small, and yet they are extremely wise. And so that's um, his, his observation here. The first one he mentions are ants, creatures of little strength, and yet they store up their food in the summer. And then he mentions a second one that he, the NIV translates as conies. Different translations, I'm quite sure, will have different uh, po possibilities for this word. It's a very obscure Hebrew word. By that, I mean that it's a word that passed out of existence. And scholars today can only look back and kind of guess at what kind of an animal this was talking about. In fact, some translations would even use the word spider. It's some kind of a little creature, but the, the most... Uh, intelligent guess seems to be that it's something like a, it's in the family of what we call a groundhog or a prairie dog or this is a marmot and I'll, I'm going to talk about it in a moment but you've, if you've been in the Rocky Mountains you might have seen one of these they're like a groundhog creature but as you can see this dude's sitting on the rocks and that's where they live and that's the reason that I picked them because that's exactly what he says about this creature the coney, the hyrax, the badger or whatever yours might have he says, they are creatures of little power, and yet they make their home in the crags, meaning the rocks. Then uh, he mentions thirdly, number verse 27, locusts. And he says, locusts have no king. Uh, and yet they advance together in ranks. So nobody's uh, kind of telling the locusts what to do, and yet somehow or other they seem to be able to do quite well because they come in groups and depend, depend on each other and they work together. And then finally, in verse 28, he says, a lizard can be caught with your hand. A little lizard, he's thinking, I think, of something like a, a gecko or something like that. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of made a mistake there. Earlier, did I mention something about spider? Okay, please forgive me. Even though that word is obscure, that word, it's pretty well known. It's some sort of a creature like a, a groundhog. Here's the word, this last one, number four, that some translations might use spider. I, I apologize about that. I didn't realize where I was. It says a lizard, and some of your translations might even have spider 
because it's, again, this is a, a, a specific word that it's just died out. And today, as translators translate, they're very unsure about exactly what type of a little tiny creature it was, but probably some kind of a lizard. But he says, you can catch them with your hand, and yet, so they're, they're, they're pretty vulnerable. I mean, you can stomp on them, or whether it's a lizard or a spider, doesn't particularly matter because the point that he's making is the same. They're very small. They're very able to be brushed aside, and yet it's amazing where they go and where they show up and what they do. So to come back to the point of these disabilities, my, my thinking is um, that when you have an ability, when you're gifted, you have a talent, then you don't have to trust anybody or anything. You don't have to trust God. You are able to achieve what you want your own self. But if that talent were taken away or you just never had it, then you are driven, you are forced to trust in something else. If you can walk and you want to visit the post office and the post office is just a short distance away, Probably you don't think anything of it. You just stand up and you just walk down to the post office. And you can do that because you have that ability. But if you are crippled, or maybe if you're elderly and your body is too weak to walk, it's not so simple as just standing up and walking to the post office. You are disabled physically and cannot do that. So now you have to use crutches or you have to use a wheelchair or a power chair. Or you might have to ask somebody, could they load you in your car and in their car and take you to the post office? You are forced to trust in something else because you are unca- incapable your own self. And this is the lesson of these little creatures that he seems to be getting uh, on. Um, I'm going to go through them all four and I'm not going to of course, I'm not an encyclopedia, or, uh, and you can look up and you know many things about these creatures, but uh, I want to just try to bring a bit of a lesson or a point from each one. First of all, this ant, the, 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 uh, the ant that which he mentions, the issue seems to be, what are we going to eat? Because he says they're, they're tiny creatures, but uh, they do something in summer important, which prepares them then for the winter. So that seems to be the issue that he's, that he's talking about here, that ants trust in, uh, oh, I, I, I didn't know how, you know, I always sort of pictured ants dragging food down in their little holes, and I thought, you know, they probably have a pantry down there, and they have shelves, and they probably can their little bits of pieces and store them in little jars, and that's sort of the vision I always had in my head, and so I got on, a, uh, did some research, I guess you could say, if that's what you call it when you get on Google. Uh, anyway, I was surprised that all these different varieties of ants have different things they do. Um, I don't have pictures, but you can look up some of the amazing things that ants do to store their food. This one, to me, was the most gross that I read about. Uh, they, many, some species of ants have a stomach specifically just to store food long term. I don't know how they know all this, but uh, during the winter, these ants have food stored up in their belly, and other ants just come up and tap them, and that's a way of saying, I'm hungry. And they'll just turn and regurgitate from their spare stomach into the... uh, I mean, it's pretty gross. Um, But some ants actually store food in their bodies. Some ants, if we've read about this, or you've seen a picture of this, have these little creatures, they call them honey pots, and they just feed this liquid sugar or stuff, and they stretch like big balloons, and then they come back and they suck it out of them. And it's all pretty phenomenal. Um, some ants are kind of like farmers. They actually grow uh, on the inside of their little chamber in the winter. They grow little funguses, and then they harvest those during the winter. They actually make preparations to set the environment for these funguses to grow so they can come back and and then eat them. My point here is um, some ants prepare for winter by basically slowing their metabolism down so they don't really need much food. They create this glycerol and antifreeze stuff. But my point is it's even though there's a variety of techniques that different species use, 
there's, no, there's nothing inaccurate about what Agur says when he says, ants store up food for winter. They do. It's not an inaccurate statement, even though they don't just always take it down their hole and tuck it in a, a little, on a little shelf somewhere. Uh, many different techniques. And uh, using these different techniques that they have, using their own God-given ability, they are able to have confidence and they're able to cope with the winter season. Those ants that live in you know, this kind of climate, they're able to do this because they are prepared for this. And this is his point. And I, I make this statement that... Uh, there's no evidence to us, I didn't talk to any ants about this, but there's no evidence that we can see that ants worry about winter. And the reason that they don't worry about it, and I'm making this as an inference as a human being, I, I, like I said, I can't talk to the ants. But the reason would, that they don't worry about how they're going to handle winter is that they're focused on handling it in the summer. They're preparing ahead of time so they know that they don't need to worry about it because they're, the simplicity of their preparation is the, sing, and the singularity of their focus is to prepare for winter. And so they don't, they don't have to stand around, um, they don't have to stand around worrying about what they're going to do when winter comes. In other words, Part of their preparation for winter is not just the food. This is my point I'm trying to get across. Part of their preparation is not just bringing the food in. Part of their preparation is that their focus is so completely on winter in the summer that they're not out lollygagging and missing the opportunity they have to be prepared for winter. They're so focused in on this that it drops off their list as a worry. Because they know that they're prepared. Um, I, I think we humans struggle with this big time. You know, in our day and time, or the internet and in the, in the wide, wide world, and we're out here with all this information and all these options available to us. And it seems to me like as a result of it, often is we're like a mile wide and an inch deep. Because... We're not focused on preparing for any one thing. We're out here absorbing everything a little bit, but nowhere are we really preparing ourselves a lot because the options and the possibilities are so wide and so available for us that we dabble with involvement everywhere, but we really don't contribute anywhere. We know a few facts about everything, but we're really not prepared for anything. You can see it in how quickly people panic, how people, how easily people panic. We make more money than ever, but we're not prepared to pay our mortgage. We want to take in all sorts of experiences, but we don't even prepare for the one experience that we know is going to come for us, and that is to die. We're not prepared for that, by and large, as people, as human beings. All of us know winter will come, but we cannot prepare if we're scurrying around, gawking everywhere at everything else during the summer, trying to just get every sap, every drop of sap out of the summer. Um, you know, I have here that that's a, the, the ant is tiny and the world is big, and I think we fall to the temptation of looking at the world today because of all the resources that we have available to us, kind of like a little ant. If you can imagine a little ant, they come up out of their hole, and they look around. Can you imagine how big the world must look to them? And what if the little ant said, wow, there's so much to see, and there's so many picnics to go to, and there's so many watering holes to visit, and the summer is so nice that I'll never stop just enjoying the summer. Uh, I'm simply saying it doesn't seem like that's how the ants function. It seems like the ants say a slice of the summer is preparation for the winter. That's what summer is. Summer is fun and summer is easy. But a slice of my summer 
is actually my preparation for winter. And therefore, um, I'm going to trust that work that I do now in the summer to reward me when the winter comes. This simple focus, I'm saying, is part of their preparation. They do not have to see all the world. They do not have to solve all the mysteries. Their expectation and their preparation is focused on the the survival. This is what Agur is, is seeing. This is what he's saying about the little, the little ants. That he's not worried about having food because he's focused on having. The, he's focused on getting that food first thing, and then he knows, he knows that he is prepared. And so this is the lesson I think of the ants, and this is the, something the Bible talks to us a lot about, and not about just food in wintertime, but about our spiritual lives and about our interrelationships with each other. Here's a verse in 2 Timothy that says, look, if, if, if you want to prepare yourself to accomplish good things, he says, then cleanse yourself of the evil thing. It's just, it's just as smart as, as an ant who's saying, I know that I want to be there in winter, so I've got to prepare for that in summer. Here's another verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is spoken to Timothy, who is a, a leader, a pastor in, the, in, in some of the churches there in, in that area of the world, in, in the area of Turkey today. But look what he says to, to Timothy. You never know when or how a need is going to arise in life. You never know when or how an opportunity is going to present itself. And so Paul says to him, look, be prayed up. Be studied up in your scripture, in the scripture. Be humble. Be uh, conservative. Don't be so strung out and empty that you're not prepared for anything. He says, have some resources. Have them in your mind. Have them in your heart. Have them in your other places in your life that you can't. Be prepared, whether it's in season or out season. In other words, it might be uh, an emergency that's almost expected, or it might be an emergency that isn't expected. shouldn't matter. If you're prepared in the summer, you can handle the winter. This is the lesson that the ants have for us. Here's the second uh, deal, and I won't go into so much detail because I don't have time. But I'm going to use the marmot as the example because, as you know, uh, if you've been out west in the Rocky Mountains, these creatures are uh, just like a groundhog, very similar to a groundhog. But the difference is, as I see it, you know, an old groundhog, they'll, they'll just put their hole anywhere. They'll put their den any old, any old place. I mean, they like to do around foundations and brush piles and stuff. But sometimes, in the, right out in the open place, or right out in the open, same way as prairie dogs, they'll put their, their holes right out in the open. And it's not hard to figure out where they are or how to get to them if you if you can if you're a coyote or you're a, you're a, uh, an eagle um, you can you can figure this out pretty quickly. The marmots up in the Rocky Mountains. My point, and I think what he's saying here is, they put their trust not in their own ability because they know that they don't always hear the eagle up over their head or they don't see the coyote that's sneaking up on them. And they, they realize that, that to trust in themselves is probably not too smart. They trust in the rocks. They put all their trust in the rocks. This is what the marmots, the marmots do. Um, they know that their disability is no match for the predators. They seem to be very wi willing to accept that fact. And so they turn to... They are driven to trust something different, and that is they use the rocks for their self-defense. And as you, as you know well, they thrive, and their population is doing just fine in the midst of any kind of predator because they're good at using the, the rocky terrain to protect them. Now, I, I want to stop and just take a second and, and, and say this. It's not just an issue of trusting. A lot of people trust a lot of things. It's not just that our disabilities cause us to trust. 
but we have to make sure that we trust what we trust actually can save us. I mean, if the marmots decided to trust their hearing or to trust some other item that wouldn't work, maybe they'd be extinct. But they've chosen well. They know that when in, in, the, in the terrain where it's all rocks and it's just very rocky, that it's very hard for a predator to get to them. And so they put their trust in what actually works. And I fear as human beings that we put our trust often in many other kinds of things. We put our trust in government. We put our trust in money. We put our trust in um, our own smarts. We put our trust in guns. We put our trust in all kinds of things that God says are really not too bright for us to stake all of our trust and 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 the faith of our lives into. I found this verse, or I, I wanted to share this verse from Jeremiah 17. And I want to think about this first phrase. He says, the Lord says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now you can expand that in a lot of ways. You know, it, it could be the ideas of man, the philosophy of man, the fact that man's going to, pull themselves out of every every emergency. Um, the, you know, currently, the about all you hear about is global warming and the crisis of, of a warming planet and the fact that somehow we are, are going to pull ourselves out of this or, or need to pull ourselves and can. And I don't know the answers for that, and that's not my point. But my point is that while we should do everything possible that we could to help ourselves with this situation, where is our trust? And the Lord says, if you just trust in man, I don't respect that. And I will not necessarily honor that. The marmot doesn't trust in itself. And Agur says, it makes its home, its house in the crags. It puts its trust in something that actually will save, save it. The, the locust, his observation there seems to be, that even though uh, they don't have a structured, formal le uh, sense of leadership, they still get where they need to go and they uh, eat what they need to, want to eat and they accomplish what they want to accomplish. Now, we don't like locusts. We hate what they do and they do a lot of destruction. But the point is, that, the, as, as I see it, is that Agor is noticing something. He's saying the locusts, destructive as they are, hateful as they are, they seem to trust each other. And they seem to, they seem to uh, instinctively follow the direction that another one is set. And then that one will follow the direction that another one sets. And they just, they just seem to, like a school of fish or a flock of birds, they just seem to feed off each other. And they just remain together because they trust each other in a sense of direction. In other words, if a locust is here nibbling on a little plant and another locust flies up to this plant, it seems that the, f the first locust says, you know what, buddy? If it's safe for you, it's safe for me. If you can go that direction, then I also will go that direction. And it, they, they seem to have this ability to trust in each other. And I want to just say this. That's not, too, that's not always uh, the case with us human beings. I think we are far more, more suspicious of each other and fearful of each other than we are trust of, trustful of each other. Now, I understand not everybody is trustworthy. All I'm trying to say is until it's proven that you're guilty, then you should be assumed to be innocent. Until it's proven that you cannot be trusted, then, we should, then people should trust you and, and you should trust others. This is the message of the Bible, especially to the Christian community. Even when you disagree, even when you, 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 know, you feel like fussing over some detail. Still, our, the goal of our lives, as Christians especially, in the church and in, a, in the Christian community, should be to feel such a unity of purpose that we say, until there's evidence that you are dishonest or dishonorable, I'm going to trust you. 
I'm going to make myself open and vulnerable to you as I possibly can. This is how I, I, I train myself to trust God. This is how God wants me to trust uh, other people. Um, and, and, and not just naturally seem to feel like, oh, you know, we live in a fallen world, so I'm sure you're here to rip me off. Um, you probably want to get everything that you can of mine before you kill me. This is the attitude of sometimes that we, that we seem to carry around almost as if we're prejudiced from the start. And, and I'm simply saying, and I, I put some scripture verses there from Romans chapter 12, where it says we should, we should open up a little, lighten up, and enjoy people, even, even people that we don't always know fully, that we, we should pr give them the presumptuous, the, I'm sorry, give them the presumption of being able to be trusted. And I think that's the, lo the le lesson from this, uh, from this locust thought. And then finally, uh, this, this thing about the lizard. Um, I, I, I just can only think of one parallel that I want to bring out. And that is that lizards or spiders or whatever. Many, many people say, you know, I know they catch flies. I know they do good stuff, but I don't want them in my house. I just think they're creepy. I think they're nasty. I think they're ugly. Uh, you know, they're dirty or whatever. Um, I don't want to stick my head in a spider web when I walk into the room. And I'm going to keep sweeping them and dusting them and, and fighting them off and, and so forth. Uh, lizards don't get much sympathy. And I'm, uh, I'm using lizard because this is what the NIV translates this word with. If there's, any, if there's an example of someone who is looked down on because they are just not popular, maybe, maybe others say to them, I don't want you around me, you're ugly, you're disabled. I, I just, I don't want to fool with you. There are those who were born behind that wall. There are people who have faced and heard that music their whole life. Go away. I don't want to mess with you. You got a problem. You're, you're undesirable and you're unpopular. What do you do if you happen to be that person? Well, Agur says the old lizard don't even pay any attention to it. You could, you could, with a sweep of the broom, you can get them out of the room, but they're there anyway. They'll come right back, and they don't go away. They just keep, and the same thing with spiders, as you well know. How many times have you cleaned up for spider, cleaned, have you wiped off spider webs, and, and they come right back? And, and he says, you know, they're so good at just being positive and optimistic and showing up and and doing, catching their flies and doing the thing that God gave them the gifts to do. They're so good at that. And they're so persistent at that. They'll just show up anywhere all the time, whether you want them or not. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Queen Elizabeth passed away. And some of you probably saw, uh, at some, some, somebody made a, a big deal out of this, that at some point uh, when her body was at, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, when when her casket, her coffin was um, out for public viewing. What's that? Yes, when she was lying in state. Thank you. Uh, crown jewels on the coffin. And a little spider was observed. And some of you might have seen this. The spider just crawls up and across the coffin, right up over the crown jewels. There's pictures. Uh, there's pictures of this spider. You know, can you imagine this dumb little spider crawling over the crown jewels of the Queen of England. I mean, here's a moment when the whole world wants to honor this lady, and here's a spider just at her in the middle of it, plodding along right in the, and, you know. But people just realize this is what spiders do. You can try to get rid of them. They'll just come back. Agur says, yeah, you, you can catch them in your hand, a little, little gecko uh, or something like that. You can catch them in your hand. But you can't stop them. Nobody kind of nobody really appreciates them or wants them, but they'll come anyway. I'm simply saying, here's the lesson of the lizard. If somebody don't like you, don't give up. Don't quit. Just say, well, 
you might sweep me out of the way with the broom, but I'll be back. Because I'm not here, I'm just here to catch flies, man. I, I just want to do what God has gifted me to do. And, and I, I, you know, whether I'm popular or not doesn't determine whether I'm deter- it doesn't determine whether I'm going to fulfill my calling or not. You may not like me. You may not sympath- have sympathy towards me. That's all right. I don't rely on sympathy. Do you see what I'm saying? That they're an example to us of that kind of an attitude. Uh, and this is what we're told to have. And this is what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 4 when he says, you know, um, we can be hard-pressed and perplexed and persecuted and all this stuff, but we're not going to quit. In fact, we never quit. We don't lose heart. They can sweep us away. They can vacuum us up. They can scream at us. They can. Uh, they don't have to like us. But our life from God is irrepressible. They can persecute us. They can kill us. And the blood of the martyrs will be the seed of the church. This is the history of the Christian faith. Though outwardly, Paul says, we're wasting away. Nobody looks at us and says, oh, yeah. In fact, they look at us and say, Ugh. But inwardly, we're getting stronger and stronger. And we're just catching flies. And we're spinning our webs. And we're doing the things that God put us here to do. And so, uh, Agor says, you know, you can do what you want to about the lizards. But they'll still end up in the palace. Because that's just how they are. They don't trust in sympathy. They trust in this... uh, irrepressible nature that they have. So let me close by saying this. If you have a disability in your life, I think number one, any type of a disability, I I would just say to you this from from these little creatures. um, This is hard. This is difficult, I'm sure. But if you're five foot tall, and you want to dunk a basketball, and you watch with envy the seven-foot-tall guy who dunks the basketball easily, and that's all you think about, and you spend your time drooling over what the others can do, and you become so dissatisfied with who you are, then you're missing the point. And I just use this phrase of, of, of like, it's like window shopping. It's like walking down the street and saying, ooh, wow. Wouldn't that be cool to have this or to own this? Or to, and if you aren't able to or you don't have that gift or you don't have that ability, just rejoice in others who do and thank God and enjoy watching and participating vicariously to the degree that you can. But don't, don't get discouraged that you don't have it because you're just sort of drooling over it all the time. I think rather the augur is saying, you know, these little creatures, they do what they can rather than, rather than focus on what they cannot do. They're not discouraged by the fact that they've got to spend part of the summer preparing for winter. They just spend part of the summer preparing for winter. And they don't, they don't say, well, think of all I'm losing in the summer. They just spend it preparing for winter because this is what they can do. And, and it's, a, it's a great lesson for us. It, it, it can lead us to trust in God in a way. Our, the disabilities that we have, the, the, the things that we face, can lead us to trust in God to such a greater degree than if we somehow were only able, uh, if we were somehow um, just able to do that our own self. I believe because of time, I'm going to just dismiss our service today. So could you please stand with me for a moment? All glory and praise and honor to you, our Father in heaven. You have created a world with lizards and with ants and with us right here, and we can see and learn and we can observe and and get smart but we can 
learn not to be discouraged of the, be, because of the disabilities that we might have, but rather to just ramp up the determination and the trust and the joy that you give to us. We pray that you will enable each of us in our own world and in our own way to do that. But thank you that we could gather here and, and, and for a moment consider these, these tiny creatures and <clears throat> that we could learn something about trusting in a greater degree. We trust you. We trust you, Lord, just like the, just, just like the marmot trusts the rocks. We trust you for the many things that we cannot do for ourselves. We trust you when we come to die because we have no ability to even know, much less process or change or what could, what could happen next. So we trust you. We put our trust in all that you've told us. We thank you for this time to share together. Dismiss us in your grace and your mercy. May you lift up your face upon us and your countenance over us and give us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray.